it is Friday, and here at Crepuscular Academy, the work of the week is done. The classrooms are dark and empty and mostly silent. The more dangerous textbooks have been locked away, so why don't you join us in my study as we delve once more into Dr. Longshadow's miscellany of the uncanny. Good evening. It is an absolute delight to welcome you once again to Crepuscular Academy on what is proving to be a particularly stormy evening. If this is your first visit, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Dr. James Archipelago Longshadow, and I am the head teacher of the aforementioned Crepuscular Academy. It is a little tradition of mine that every Friday evening, when our studies have been completed for the week, I invite my pupils to join me in my study where they partake of hot chocolate, a biscuit or two, and of course, a story. This little soiree is a particularly welcome distraction this week as we have had some, how shall I put it, some small amount of excitement in the physics department. It transpired that some of the pupils from the upper sixth were tinkering with old radio parts and other less wholesome devices, and succeeded in inadvertently creating a working time machine. The whole class was lost to us for the best part of the afternoon. However, they eventually returned, and are expected to make a more or less full recovery. Their teacher, Mr. Hartnell, has assured me that no timelines have been altered. But then again... How would we know? Ah, technology. Unarguably, when used in the right way, it is a boon to humanity. The key to our dominance on the planet. It has changed so many things. The way in which we learn, the way in which we relax, the way in which we communicate and keep in touch. Vast distances are as nothing to us now. I can be talking to someone on the other side of the planet in no time at all. Indeed, who amongst us can say with any certainty what the limits of these wonderful toys might be? And so, we come to this evening's tale, which I have decided to call Planchette. Please, sit back, relax, and join us for this week's story from Dr. Longshadow's Miscellany of the uncanny. Everyone in school knew about Adam. He was the boy in year eight who had become ill, exceedingly ill, with a disease that paid no heed to his youth or his vitality or the fact that he had barely begun to live out his life. There had been fundraising from his friends Brave words and shared thoughts from the head teacher in assembly. There had been optimism. For a while, there had been the hope that the poor boy was getting better. And then, he didn't. The effect of his death on those who were close to him, his family, his friends, can barely be imagined, let alone truly understood. The effect of his death on those outside of his circle was less obvious, but still considerable. When you are young, you are immortal. Oh, you know about death. You have heard about it, but when you are strong and fit and full of vim and vigor, it is an impossible thought. The idea of a universe existing without you is unthinkable. You are the universe its center, the whole reason for its existence. Therefore, the death of someone young, someone, say, the same age as you, someone you may have brushed shoulders with in a busy school corridor, brings the possibility of your own end a little more into focus. It unnerves, it unsettles, but it also fascinates. 
So it was with the two boys who were whiling away the hours in a local park a week after Adam's funeral. They were older than he had been, and knew him only through reputation, but still he featured large in their thoughts as they sat wasting Friday evening away on the swings. The younger children, for whom the play equipment had been designed, had long since gone home, and the park was now given over to the teens who gathered there for want of anything else to do. Where do you reckon Alex is? said one, a tall boy called Daniel. He said he'd be there at football. Don't know, replied his companion. Simon was shorter than Daniel, and was sporting the hopeful first suggestion of a moustache. Check FM. The FM to which Simon referred was, and as far as I know still is, a popular mobile phone application. Its full title was Findamate, and it did exactly what its name suggested. If you had a friend who was also registered on the system, find a mate could tell you where they were, down to the square meter. Far from being rejected as a terrifying Orwellian invasion of privacy, this app had proved nearly indispensable amongst its target audience, who were actually legally too young to use it. They seemed unable to go for more than five minutes without checking on the whereabouts of their acquaintances. In addition, as FindMate notified users if someone had been seeking clarification as to their geographical position, it had given rise to a new strain of anxiety amongst those who had not been sought recently. A phone was duly produced, and the app fired up. Daniel typed in, Find Alex 17. The screen displayed a radar, similar to those that furnish the control rooms of submarines in many an exciting film. You know the sort of thing. A dramatic green arc of light swept around for a few seconds, and then a message was displayed. Alex 17 is 1.5 kilometers away. The map that appeared showed a glowing red dot with the caption, Alex 17, next to it. He's still at school, said Daniel. I'll bet Callaghan kept him in late again. Mr. Callaghan was the head of PE and seemed determined to continue the tradition for unfair fearsomeness that PE teachers the world over have become legendary for. Might as well go on, Daniel said. Why? There's nothing to do here. Although he would never have said anything, Simon did not relish the idea of going home. He and his father had not been getting on lately, and the thought of another evening spent listening to the older man list his son's shortcomings and bemoaning his lack of ambition didn't appeal terribly much. We could go to the cemetery, he said gesturing to the bleak brick wall that separated the park from the cemetery that lay on the other side. Simon had no idea where that thought had come from. You what? Daniel replied. The cemetery? We could go and see where that Adam kid's been buried. Why? Are you scared? said Simon. No, of course not. It's just a bit... It's a bit weird. You are scared. Come on then, we'll go. And so, fueled by bravado and the desire not to be seen as weak by the other, they headed across the park, not before sending the swings around the crossbars so many times that they would have to be unwound before they could be enjoyed again, and climbed over the wall into the cemetery. It was not a particularly old cemetery. The first burial had been in 1952, when the churchyards of the town, not to mention the huge but overcrowded East Grivington necropolis, had failed to keep up with demands of a growing population. As such, it had been designed with a relatively modern approach, and laid out to be pleasing and comforting to the visitors. It had none of the sinister shadowy, ivy-overgrown lanes and toppled headstones 
that its older Victorian predecessor on the other side of the town boasted. This was a cemetery of wide open spaces. Benches, young trees, and neat rows of shiny headstones. Even so, a cemetery is still a cemetery. The boys fell silent as they walked down the path that bisected the two main areas of graves. The evening was summer lit, and the headstones cast long shadows. The last legitimate visitors had long since departed, and the thought that they were alone with hundreds of bodies not so far beneath their feet was a sobering one. They found Adam easily enough. The flowers, cards, and toys left by well-wishers were still piled high next to the ugly mound of earth that had yet to be flattened. Simon and Daniel stood looking down at the newly installed headstone. Of course, they knew how old Adam had been, but seeing the dates so sadly close to each other was a stark reminder. The noise of nearby traffic faded, and the silence grew thick around them. Daniel could feel the change. The air was suddenly full of potential, filled with a sense of something about to happen. Simon sensed it as well. He scrabbled for a diversion. I dare you to stand on it, he said quietly, nodding at the grave. What? said Daniel. Stand on it, I dare you. Get stuffed, chicken. No, it's just... Well, it's not right. I'll do it then. With that, Simon climbed on top of the mound. See? he said. Get down, Daniel hissed, looking around. Why? Do you reckon he'll get me? Just get down, please. Simon could tell his friend was genuinely upset, and to be honest, his brain was busy showing him images of the loose earth giving way and him falling onto, even into, the coffin below. All right, all right, he said. He jumped off and scuffed his trainers on the grass to rid himself of the grave dirt. Daniel kept looking at the headstone. Where do you reckon he is? he said. Oh, Alex, he's at school? No, him, the kid, he said, pointing to the grave. For some reason he couldn't explain, he did not wish to say Adam's name out loud. Well, it's supposed to be six feet, but I don't think they bother digging that. No, not his body. His, you know, his, his soul. Let's find out, Simon said. What? Simon fished out his phone. What are you doing? Daniel said. Just wait. Simon opened Find Mate. He typed in something and then held it up so Daniel could see. Find Adam. Should I do it? He said, grinning. But Daniel wasn't laughing or even smiling. No, he said. Don't. Oops. Simon pressed the Find button and grinned. You idiot! Shh! It's looking for him. He waved the phone around as if he was trying to get a better signal. Over time, the radar screen swept around and around. Both boys waited, holding their breath. The radar swept around and around again, and then a message appeared. Adam cannot be found. Oh, well, said Simon. Worth a try. I'm going home, Daniel said. He had enough of his friend's idiotic behaviour. You shouldn't mess with stuff like this. Stuff like what? He's hardly going to text us, is he? Still, I don't think we should. Daniel was unable to put words to the dread feeling that urged him to leave. Oh, fine, let's go, said Simon. They turned to leave. It was then that Simon had a thought. Whatever chill warnings were whispering themselves to his friend, they had obviously not reached him. I cannot explain why Simon did what he did next. If we were able to ask him directly, I doubt he would be able to tell us either. 
Perhaps it was as simple as having something to brag to his friends about. Or could it be that he was in some way jealous? Hold on, he said. I want a souvenir. Simon looked around, and assured that there were no visitors, he returned to the grave and examined the flowers and gifts more closely. He had never understood why people left stuff like this on graves. It would just get moldy, wouldn't it? His eyes rested on one item in particular. It was a collectible football card, showing a picture of what had been Adam's favourite player. It also happened to be Simon's favourite player. What the hell are you doing? Daniel hissed. It's wasted here, Simon replied. It'll just get manky and wet and end up getting thrown away. And he's not going to use it, is he? With that, he picked up the card and slipped it into his jacket pocket. The boys left the cemetery then, and if they walked a little quicker than normal, Neva mentioned it. Later that night, Simon was woken by the sound of a notification from his phone. It was 1.13 a.m. He moaned and fumbled for his phone, which was sitting on his bedside table, next to the purloined football card. Which idiot was texting him at this time of night? However, it was not a text. Find a mate was open, and the radar sweep was going round and round. Suddenly, it stopped. A message appeared. Adam is two kilometers away. The map came up showing the cemetery. A black dot was moving slowly across the map. Quickly, Simon shut down the app. He shook his head to clear it. It's a glitch, he thought to himself, or a prank. It's, it's probably Daniel getting his own back for getting scared in there. The app opened again. Adam is one kilometer away. This time the map showed the black dot moving away from the park and towards the estate where Simon lived. Jabbing his finger violently, he put the phone on silent. He threw it on the floor next to his bed. His room was darker than usual. He ducked under the quilt and closed his eyes. The phone buzzed. Slowly. He reached a hand out and pulled it under the quilt. Adam is 85 meters away. The map now showed Simon's street. The black dot was moving down it towards his house. Anger overtook fear and he threw back the quilt. He went to the window and pulled back the curtains. He was going to kill whoever was trying to wind him up like this. He looked up and down his road. There was nobody there. He stood there for nearly five minutes, waiting, looking. Stupid prank, he thought. That's all. Even so, he held down the power button and turned the phone completely off. It buzzed. Slowly, Simon held it up and looked at the screen. The air was suddenly filled with a sweet, wet, earthy smell. Adam is behind you. Everyone in school knew about Simon. He was the boy who had been found curled up in the corner of his bedroom one morning, newly white-haired, and his face frozen in a rictus of silent terror. He was the boy who now lived in a facility where the staff all spoke softly and had kind faces. He was the boy who could not or would not speak to anyone. He was the boy who would start screaming 
if he saw anyone using a mobile phone. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this week's tale. My students tell me that you are now able to review my ramblings. If you have the time, please do tell me what you think, if only to give the pupils here fuel with which to rip their poor old headmaster. I look forward to talking to you next time, as once again we share a tale from Dr. Longshadow's miscellany of the uncanny. Good night. <laughs>